Thank you, <coughs> Arvind. Thank you, uh, Sarath and Renana, for inviting me. Uh, I have to start with uh, two caveats. One is that uh, uh, the views that I express are entirely personal, whether they are private sector or not, I, I, I think it's for you to judge. Uh, and notwithstanding the fact that Christine Lagarde is also very interested in these issues, these are still personal views and not reflecting that those are the institution with which I'm associated. And the second is that uh, I really have no history or association with this domain at all. Uh, so I'm not quite clear why I was invited, but you know it's difficult to, uh, to say no, so I accepted. And I think the basis of that invitation was an op-ed that I wrote in the Economic Times a few months ago, uh, which was actually a sort of response to an earlier one by Swaminathan Iyer, uh, which basically dismissed the idea, the merits of a UBI. And uh, I was pretty agnostic at that point, and I think I still am agnostic. Uh, but I found this categorical dismissal a bit difficult to accept. So I uh, had done some number work in my previous uh, position uh, where I was focusing on health and education issues, and one of the issues I was looking at was uh, the role of private provision. How much do people spend on private providers or private uh, sources of health and education services? Uh, so I thought those numbers uh, actually, although they were not, the analysis not done uh, in the context of a UBI discussion, uh, I thought those numbers provided some insight into the merits uh, or the case for UBI, and that's what I want to present. Uh, I think the uh, foundation, the philosophical foundations of this concept uh, were very well articulated by uh, Guy, uh, but I want to add a slightly different dimension to that, and that is what uh, I refer to as the social uh, compact. So could we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so what is the social com compact? And the way I see it, uh, there, there is, of course, a concept called the social contract, which I think is slightly, slightly different. But uh, the way I see a social compact is essentially the uh, contractual foundation, if you will, the implicit contractual foundation of a welfare state, which is that the state is committed to providing certain services to citizens. Uh, and some of these commitments are stated, are enshrined in the form of rights. Uh, for example, we now have, and we look at the fundamental rights, of course there is a series of these, but explicit uh, commitments, uh, the, I think the, the, the best example is the, uh, what we refer to as the RTE, but its full form is the right of children to free and compulsory education. Uh, I think it's free and compulsory is, are, are the, the key words here. Uh, which was enacted in 2009. Uh, and from a health perspective, and those are the two domains in which I've been uh, dabbling, so I'll, I'll confine myself to those. Uh, only when I tell you, please. Uh, from the health perspective, the uh, articulation of health policies, and we have one that has recently been, uh, been put out into the public domain, uh, always refers to universal access. I mean, in a sense, it is a commitment that the state is making as a policy, obje policy objective that all citizens should have access to health care. And access doesn't just mean the presence of services, it means also the ability to, to use them. Uh, so if you look at health and education as prime examples of the social compact, uh, in a sense the state is taking on the obligation of ensuring that uh, everybody has access to health, access to education. So let's go to the next one. Now, a very interesting set of numbers was put out by the NSSO in 2014, or well, it was published in 2015, but this was a survey done, the 71st round in 2014, uh, around 66,000 households, so not the full consumer expenditure survey, but about slightly less than half of that. Uh, so very substantial nationwide and allowing for differentiation across states and so on. I haven't gotten that level of detail here. But uh, it is a fascinating description of the way in which people are spending money on health and education. Uh, and I think some of the points that uh, Guy made, and I'll come back to this at the end, uh, 
about discretion, about autonomy, I think are quite uh, you know, powerfully reflected in this, uh, this, this set of numbers. So just to give you some snapshot, uh, so highlights uh, from a very otherwise very rich set of data. Uh, we all know this problem, the dropout problem uh, that uh, our schooling system has. Uh, the net attendance ratio, the gross enrollment ratio actually is even higher than 100 because many kids are enrolled in more than one school. But the net attendance ratio shows up very positively as 87%. Uh, so classes one to five or so, uh, most kids are in school and attending, but drops off very sharply to 52% uh, percent in secondary, so something is going wrong here. Somewhere the commitment to provide education is breaking down. Uh, is it a matter of choice? Are people opting out? Uh, and therefore the state no longer has the responsibility or is it a matter of circumstance and uh, reflecting some sort of structural barrier and I'll come back to this point later. And the drop off is even higher from uh, the secondary to higher secondary essentially the 10 and 12. Uh, so we actually have only 38% of our uh, school going population uh, going through into the higher secondary phase which obviously means significant limitations in terms of occupational choices subsequently. Uh, in terms of the access to free education, not a bad picture again. 60% uh, of students in primary school are receiving free education as per the survey. 62% uh, roughly the same receive midday meals. Uh, I take uh, Mr. Drabu's description of the midday meal process. You know, I think we have to uh, keep these these ground level uh, details in mind, but at least at the macro level, 62% isn't uh, such a bad number. But uh, there again, as we see transition from primary to secondary, we see uh, drop off, and uh, only 35% of kids in secondary school uh, actually receive free education. Uh, and the last uh, uh, dimension here is that 20% uh, of primary students, and this is across all income groups, uh, I'm, I'm not differentiated by, by uh, the income category here, uh, take uh, private coaching in primary school and 35% at the secondary in HS. So we're talking about people feeling, in a sense, compelled to supplement the formal education system with uh, private coaching. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? Just to put some spending numbers on this. Uh, so this is the average, as per this survey, all these are from, from this survey. Average expenditure per student for an academic session uh, in the rural primary segment is about 2,800 uh, rupees. That, what does that mean? Does it, is it a lot, is it little? But I'll put it into some comparative perspective a little later. Uh, but as you go to secondary, and you'll see that the ratio multiplies very sharply. The, ratio, the multiple is very sharp. Uh, we move from about 3,000 to 9,000, so it's almost three, a tripling of uh, expenditure per student uh, in, transition, in the transition from primary to secondary. And uh, in the urban areas, the basic level is quite high to begin with, uh, and it doubles to what appears to be even without any specific context, a pretty substantial number uh, if this is the average that the whole population is spending uh, on secondary education in urban areas. Let's look at it in terms of a share of Should income. Say, Sorry? By government. No, this is by household. This is all household expenditure. Household. Yeah. There is no, there is no okay. public finance in this. Uh, next slide, please. So just to put this into a sort of uh, a family context or a household context. Take a household of five with uh, two kids in primary, the, it would be spending about one month's equivalent, and this I'm then mapping to the uh, consumer expenditure survey estimates of household expenditure, per capita monthly expenditure, uh, at the 60th percentile. So I'm not even talking about poverty line here, I'm talking about almost twice the poverty line in terms of the percentile uh, position, uh, spending about uh, one month's worth of household expenditure 
on kids in primary school, two kids in primary school, uh, with two kids in secondary at the rural, uh, in rural households, three months equivalent expenditure. Uh, and in the urban areas, the primary education, you saw about uh, 10,000 rupees per child per session, uh, spending about two months equivalent of monthly per capita expenditure at the 60th percentile uh, and almost four months uh, equivalent in secondary. Uh, so here I think the point that Guy made about, you know, why you worry about how we spend our money. We, we, we should be best, uh, you know, we, we're in the best position to decide what we spend. And I think here when looking at the commitment of households to, uh, to educating their, uh, their kids, uh, these numbers certainly reinforce that uh, perception. Let's go to the next one, please. On the health side, uh, a very significant comment on the relative roles of private and public services. Uh, if you take patients overall, this is hospital plus other facilities, primary health centers, clinics, uh, sub-centers, and so on, uh, about 24% of males and 26% of females, this is both rural and urban, so about a quarter of the entire patient population in the survey used public facilities. And when we confine the, uh, the, the, pop, the use of, hosp confine this to the use of hospitals, 42% uh, rural and 32%, so about a third uh, in the urban areas uh, use public hospitals. So again, we see a predominance of private provision of healthcare, both in the rural and in the urban areas. Uh, when we look at the average cost per hospital stay, this is across all hospitals, not just private. We have about 17,000 rupees per patient per episode of uh, hospitalization. So it's called, I think, technically spell of ailment. Uh, which is three months equivalent monthly expenditure, uh, and for urban space, uh, patients, not very different, about two and a half months uh, equivalent uh, of monthly expenditure at the 60th percentile. Again, this is way above the poverty line when we look at the income distribution. So very significant uh, impacts of a high dependence on private provision, whether it is in the education space or the health space. Uh, so let me conclude by looking at a set of implications and uh, a set of issues. Uh, so I see UBI in a sense as, to use a term that uh, for those of you, and certainly I did study economics from a very early age, uh, in, in one of the earliest textbooks you look at a micro, introductory microeconomics, uh, you come across this term compensating variation. Uh, it's, a, it's a term that is attributed to Hicks, and it basically means how, do, how much you have to pay somebody uh, to keep them at a given level of, of welfare. Uh, so for example, if in this situation, if the social compact is that you should have access to health and education, that the state is taking on that commitment to provide it, but you are being asked or, or driven to uh, private provision, uh, then how much should the state compensate you for accessing that level of service? I'm not getting into quality issues and so on, those are, those are separate issues. Uh, but I see then in addition to, and I'm not in any way uh, so, uh, you know, undermining or, or questioning the basic safety net aspect of uh, UBI, which was talked about earlier, uh, that as a way of offsetting the impact on household expenditures of accessing uh, the private provision of public services, uh, this is one way to think about it. Uh, so transfers to household offset expenditures under the social compact is, is one dimension of UBI that I think is important. Well, what about universality then? Why should that, I think, is a point that uh, uh, Arvind Subramaniam made in his remarks, which is the huge challenges. Uh, Mr. Drabu also made this point in his remarks. The huge challenges that you have with targeting. Let's be practical. Uh, the minute you start targeting, you are vulnerable to 
charges of discrimination, of wrongful exclusion, of wrongful inclusion, and then lobbying for, uh, for eligibility and so on, just maybe it's a whole lot easier to make it uh, universal. Last slide. Uh, then, of course, there are issues. Uh, fiscal space is, is often mentioned, and I believe uh, Sudip Mandal is going to be talking about this uh, in, in uh, tomorrow's session. So uh, it is a challenge how much, uh, how, how much can the state afford to do. Uh, uh, Mr. Drabu's calculations in relation to his own state uh, suggest that if you think about it creatively, there is uh, fiscal space available. I understand that uh, Sudipto's analysis also suggests that at national level there is fiscal space available. Uh, but it does mean uh, some sort of streamlining, some sort of uh, compression of existing schemes and so on. Uh, and uh, that's an issue I think that will be very central in the discussion uh, going forward. Uh, how much should it be? Uh, I don't have an answer to that question. But I think somewhere the idea of what you're providing it for becomes a basis. And I think the use of uh, monthly expenditures or household expenditures on a list of what might be considered public services uh, does provide some basis for computing the amount. And uh, I believe that that's, that is the, uh, going to provide a sort of rational and objective uh, foundation for uh, calculating the amount, which should not be done on a kind of completely ad hoc uh, of basis of convenience. Uh, and of course, the opt-out, which we've seen, at least as far as we know, fairly successfully implemented in the LPG subsidy, where you just decide, look, I don't want this. Uh, a lot of people may just decide that they don't want it. So even though it's universal in terms of eligibility, it may not actually be universal in terms of implementation. Uh, the last point uh, is about public facilities. I think uh, this has been a, a significant issue in the PDS versus cash transfer uh, uh, debate, uh, that it's all very well to talk about giving people cash and allowing the, or asking them to buy all their basic necessities from the market. But the counter to that is that uh, there are many parts of the country where this, the markets simply don't work the way we think that or way we, we think they should. And so the provision of some level of public uh, service is important. Uh, but I think when you combine UBI with public services, uh, the issue or the argument that they should be free uh, then goes away. That becomes weaker. So because you're paying people to use services and they, there are public services, then uh, setting appropriate user charges, I think, is something that uh, does help. And here is where I think the fiscal space also becomes uh, less of a concern, assuming that all of these things can be implemented uh, you know, effectively. Uh, so let me conclude with two uh, thoughts on points that I heard uh, being made by earlier speakers. Uh, I think the uh, point that Mr. Drabu made about uh, decentralization is very critical. Uh, letting people, I think also ties in with what uh, Guy was saying, uh, letting people ultimately decide as individuals uh, what they want to spend money on. Uh, so we see this trend at the, uh, at the fiscal level, at the national fiscal level, where the underlying principle of the 14th Finance Commission allocations uh, was to move away from central uh, control over state uh, spending patterns. Uh, and give states more discretion. So we move from an uh, untied percentage of, of uh, transfers of 32% of the total uh, revenue base to now 42%. Uh, earlier it was 32 plus several amounts of uh, lots of tie, tying in conditionalities. That's changed. I think the very significant uh, uh, change in position and orientation, decentralized expenditure, that's, that's the way to get uh, more efficiency. Uh, and so the logical uh, extension of that argument uh, would be, well, if, if the center believes that states should have more and more discretion, more and more power, uh, then should the state not believe then that you know, local authorities and by extension ultimately individuals should have more and more discretion. And so there's a sort of continuity of, of uh, outlook in that. 
the second uh, uh, point I want to make uh, in sort of a global context, uh, Guy's characterization of the interest of uh, large global uh, multinationals in this issue uh, basically stemming from uh, some anxiety about what is happening to employment patterns across the world and therefore the need to, uh, to think in terms of uh, reasonable safety nets to accommodate lots of people. I mean, look at some of the European countries, youth unemployment in, in many European countries, uh, that is people below the age of 25 or so, is into, well into double digits, and in many cases uh, above 20, 20%. So this, this would basically mean that there is a large number of people in these countries uh, who are never going to work in their lives. If, if you have youth unemployment of 25%, it means a, there's, a, there's a reasonable chance that you will never actually have a job in your life because the, the, if you don't have a job by the time you're 30, the chances are you're not really going to get one after that. Uh, so the safety net angle of this is very important, but I think we have to, in our discussion, also focus on the welfare angle in the sense of delivering, getting public services delivered, I mean, making sure that people have the ability to access these very, very basic and critical services, health and education, perhaps a few others. So let me stop with that. Thank you very much for inviting me.